Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And just let you know that we're recording this call for transparency for documentation and educational purposes. And we'll be posting this uh, social media so others can uh, see this as well. So I want to thank you, uh, you know, for joining us in, in, in this uh, empathy circle. Uh, this is a series of empathy circles we're doing to uh, sort of envision uh, what we uh, what to do with the building a retreat center at 16 at 1964 Las Canoas uh, Road in Santa Barbara. And so we want to hear from everyone what your vision and ideas are. And uh, we also, if anyone is watching this on on uh, uh, recording of this on YouTube, that we invite you, if you're in Santa Barbara, to come and uh, talk with us uh, and join one of these empathy circles. We're going to be, uh, we have the information in the discussion, uh, in the description uh, down below, there'll be a link there. So let's just start with uh, maybe taking a one minute uh, introduction for each of us, just who who is here. Uh, just say, you know, your name, your location, and why you're interested uh, in taking part here. And I'll, I'll, I'll model that. I'm Edwin Rutsch. I'm the director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And I've been working for about 15 years on the topic of how do we create a more empathic society and culture. And uh, my brother Charles has uh, just purchased the property there on Canoas Road and uh, asked if I'd like to be involved in, in the development of a retreat center there. So I said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so um, that's why I'm here and I'm trying to organize these empathy circles to really create a forum for the for the, where the community can come and kind of share their thoughts and have a seat at the table for the development of, of this space. Uh, so everyone feels uh, included in it and also to hear everyone's uh, insights. Uh, so Charles, do you wanna introduce yourself next? Okay, my name is Charles Rutsch. <clears throat> Edwin is my brother. I bought the property at auction a month or so ago. Um, I have a wife and four children. We live in Sacramento, California. Um, I'm just kind of like a private investor, real estate, stocks, that kind of thing. That's all. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lou? Like you. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Lou Zwire. <clears throat> um, I live in Petaluma, which is Northern California, um, North Bay. Um, I'm a former um, executive in the California State University system doing technology and learning. Did that for 27 years. Um, I'm also a principal at the Authentic Leadership Center in Sacramento that does leadership transformational leadership training. And I've been working with Edwin <clears throat> at the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy for probably about five or six years, doing Empathy Circle work with him, both in live in places like Berkeley, like um, UC Berkeley, and then also online for a long time. And, for, and I helped design the Empathy Circle training, facilitator training that we've been doing for about two and a half years with cohorts of people from around the world on Zoom. Uh, and I'm really interested Santa Barbara, I grew up in Southern California and um, I have many family members that went to UC Santa Barbara. And so I know the Santa Barbara town well. Uh, no, no, I know the Santa Barbara town. And uh, and the idea of um, having a retreat center there in Southern California is just really exciting. So I'm not sure what role I wanna play, but I definitely wanna support building a culture of empathy. And, and I think what Charles has done by buying the center and wanting to create like a center for, you know, personal transformation or building a more empathic society or whatever combination of stuff it ha is going to do is very exciting to me. Okay, thanks, Lou. Uh, Jessica, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. I'm the honorary woman here. Oof. My name is Jessica Lowenstein, and I am uh, a neighbor of the retreat center uh, for about 12 years. I live in Santa Barbara. My husband and I also went to UCSB, and um, so we've been spending time here for almost 40 years, but we've been living here for 12. So I look out over, I'm one ridge over, and I look out over the retreat center. Um, and I'm a psychotherapist and meditation teacher and spiritual teacher, and I have attended 
many retreats in my life and have taught retreats. Um, so obviously it's a thrilling prospect to have a retreat center in my backyard. Um, and I, I guess I thought maybe I could offer some um, <clears throat> insight into someone for someone who teaches and attends retreats all over the world. Mm, thank you. Uh, Kent? Well, hello from the Zuni Mountains of New Mexico. Uh, my name is Kent Ferguson. Uh, and I guess I could say my life has been schools. I've been involved with about 24 of them now uh, from age seven to 77. I did spend 35 wonderful and grand years in Santa Barbara, uh, where, among other things, I, I founded, or I guess I should say co-founded the Santa Barbara Middle School, where I was the uh, uh, headmaster for 20 years before I went to New Zealand to start the school down under there. Um, and in Santa Barbara, I was also blessed to uh, help found something called the Institute of World Culture and another organization called uh, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Uh, and I know of St. Mary's because I also helped found something called the Santa Barbara Summit for Tibet. And in that guise, uh, we looked at St. Mary's, I'm going to guess six years ago, I wouldn't want to be held too closely to that, but uh, it was then for sale. And uh, we envisioned it as a, a retreat center, but with an emphasis on, uh, I guess you could call it an ecumenical monastery where we hoped to bring in uh, Tibetans and Native Americans and so forth. And um, I feel very blessed to be part of this, quite honestly. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Kent. Uh, Greg, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Greg Dawson, grew up here in Santa Barbara, stupidly moved away, and then moved back to care for my folks. Uh, my background is predominantly in healthcare, um, hospital administration, device sales, and then I spent a number of years doing uh, uh, consulting working with organizations that had uh, cultures that were not synced up. Um, got involved with the Turner Foundation actually through their Good Life TV show. I saw a show about a guy who took what was handed to him as a child and all the challenges that he had has become successful and now is giving back to the community that nobody knows. And so I started watching those shows and I said, this is awesome. These are folks who have a heart for our city, who have a heart for people who serve well that nobody knows about. And I said, I got to get involved with that. And then when this property came up for sale, Dean and I were talking about what, what could a ret retreat center look like and what kind of things could we facilitate to create unity in our community and give people a place to connect. So that's my involvement and why I'm here. And Dean would ordinarily be here, but he has a board meeting this morning. So he sent the new guy. Well, glad you could join us, uh, Greg. So uh, what we're going to be using is what we call the empathy circle uh, process. So, you know, as uh, Lou has mentioned, that we, we, our, our goal is really to create a more empathic society. And the core of that is just that everybody listens to each other and that really is sensitive to each other's uh, experiences. And we find that the empathy circle practice is a really good foundational first step gateway practice uh, for building those listening uh, and empathy skills and for everyone feeling heard and, and, and included. So we want to uh, use that practice. And I, I had sent out the information on how to take part in that. Um, uh, but the, the core of it is, is we'll have one person be the speaker, you'll select who you speak to, and our topic, which I'm going to put into the uh, chat discussion uh, area here, is what is your vision for 1964 Las Canoas Road, uh, Santa Barbara, uh, the retreat center, and or whatever is is on your mind so you can share a thought or two and then pause you know which is usually within you know 45 seconds to a minute pause and let the person who you selected to be your listener reflect back their understanding of of what you have uh, said and as jessica's a 
therapist, you, you, you know the practice, active listening. So it's basically based on active listening. And then you check, does the, the reflection that you get, is that accurate? If the person didn't understand it, you can say it in other words until you feel heard and understood to your satisfaction. And then you will have four minute turns. And Aralu, would you be willing to uh, take, keep the time? Do you sure, have a timer sure. there? And you'll hold up something, I don't know, the, a clock or I, I have a time like that. Just And at that point, you want to just wrap up, finish what you're saying, like within a sentence or two, and then get your final reflection. And then the listener then becomes the speaker and they select who they're going to speak to. And we just kind of do the same process and we'll go for, you know, about an hour and 15 minutes, hour, 20 minutes. And then we'll have some time just for open discussion uh, without using uh, the process. Uh, but it's a really good first step gateway. And especially since we want the center to be based on empathy, supporting a culture of empathy, that we're we're sort of walking the talk here. We're, 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 we're doing the practice uh, that we're and then this mindset that we're advocating for or working towards. So I'll keep time on my phone. And when the time is up, there'll be a chime that goes off. And if I don't think you're hearing the chime, then I'll hold up this sign. Oh, which uh, I'll guess I'll turn my blurred background off because otherwise that won't work. I'll hold uh, that says time. And actually, I guess I need to also reverse my video so that it reads properly. Oh, it looked okay from... I saw it time at the time. Oh, was, it was uh, for us. Yeah, correct. for me. It oh, was. Really? okay. Interesting. So Back we can get started. Me. Would you want to be the first listener since I've been doing so much talking here? Would you be the first listener, Lou, uh, just sure. to model the listening? So whoever would like to start, speak to Lou. And uh, uh, the topic is what is your vision for retreat center at 1964 Las Canoas Road? Yeah. So who would like to be the first speaker? Well, I'd be happy to go first, Edwin. And um, okay. uh, I assume we'll have at least two or three turns, so to speak. And I do want to get into exactly what you said, a possible vision. But I'd like to just uh, a teeny bit of background. Uh, my son is now 40, but he played basketball at St. Mary's when he was 15. So uh, I used to visit the property. And I've already mentioned about the Santa Barbara Summit. And which led me to tour the property several times. Um, and I mentioned that because I know the property, but what I did not know when I heard that your brother Charles had purchased it was the vision. And so I started thinking, uh, by the way, should I stop Edwin or shall I keep going? Can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, and the person who's the listener can ask the speaker to pause, you know, if they're saying more than you can take in. So, yeah, so what I've gotten so far is just you want people to understand your connection to the property that you've been there before, that your son played basketball there. And uh, and but you're really curious about the vision part. Right. And um, so the reason why I'm here now and rather excited about it is because uh, knowing the property, I did not know the vision. And so knowing the property and the size of it, my first thought was, well, whoever, Charles or Edwin, whoever these people are, they're going to have to stock the place with many different activities, many different projects, many different groups, because I was thinking, how else are they going to have a, a sustainable meaning at that time, financially sustainable operation. But in the past month, I have... Uh, well, I could easily say very much enjoyed a lot of interaction with Edwin. And he sends out, as most of you know, tons of uh, information. He's really passionate about this empathy thing. And th the more I listened and read, the, the more I thought, well, this vision is big enough to carry the place with a lot of help. And I want to come back to that next time I talk. Thanks. Yeah, so you're saying that... Um when you because you're familiar with the property and how large it is uh, and kind of what the financial nut for running it would be you were thinking in, in initially well there needs to be a you know very large mix of programs there in order to sustain it but after having a bunch of interactions with edwin and understanding kind of the work he does and the person that he is you are thinking that maybe um the center could have one focus which is about building a culture of empathy you think that might be a possibility 
Exactly. Thank you. I feel very heard. Okay. And you still have two minutes if you want to keep talking, if you have more you want to say right now. Uh, I think I'll, I'll wait until my next turn. Thank okay. you, Will. All right. Uh, okay, so let's see my turn. So I'll speak to Jessica. If that's all right with you, Jessica? Yes. Okay. Um, so I thought immediately what Kent thought. <laughs> I had the same kind of analysis when, when I saw the place and the size of it. You know, that um, first, I'm very excited. So the idea of having a place that actually has um, dormitories, you know, and in, in other words, it's really designed for residential retreats because I've been involved with through the leadership training I do and other kinds of things. I've also been involved in a lot of workshop types of things and training. And so having a facility that really is designed for residential work is very exciting because, you know, it takes time to do good work. And so having a place where people can stay uh, is very significant. I'll stop there. Okay. So what I've heard so far is that like Kent, you were a little concerned at the beginning about how it would be utilized because it's so large. But after learning more from Edwin um, and doing the work yourself and knowing what is possible um, and and the fact that it can house people for residential work, which is very exciting to you because it takes a while to do deep work, um, made you more you know, excited about being involved in the project. Yeah, so, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity here uh, that I am very excited about. And I think, you know, I am actually in hearing more of Ken's thinking about how maybe it could be a single thing, because I still kind of hold that I think it probably has to be a large mix of things in order to, because I, you know, I think my understanding is that the the basic running of the place is maybe like four or $500,000 a year or something like that, just covering the cost, which is, you know, that's a lot of economic activity. And so it, it seems to me like it would need to be a mix of a very large uh, variety of things. Um, I'll stop there. So, so I'm basically hearing that that you'd like to hear more from Kent about how it could be a single operational retreat center because you, based on how much it would cost to run it every year, you still feel that you we would need it would need multiple programs to sustain. Yeah, and. I guess the other thing that just is present in me right now to say is just about my my um, strong faith, I guess, not religious faith, but experiential faith in um, the empathy, empathy work that Edwin and I have been doing together, that he's been doing longer than me, but that I've I've been doing, and I, you know, I also I have a, a deep background in nonviolent communication and in conflict resolution, restorative practices. And all of those things involve listening, kind of the way we're doing now, which is really listening carefully to people and showing that you understand what they're saying. And it's um, amazing to me how just that little thing of really listening to people and letting them know that you understand them, how that transforms relationships. Yeah, so... so I might have to have you repeat the very first part, but the the essence of what I got was that this work is so powerful and so needed and so transformative, just the act of, of listening and that you have a uh, deep background in it and met, you know, not just with the empathy circle, but with your conflict resolution and, and just how powerful it is, how transformative it is. Yeah, it's amazing to, in the empathy circle training work that we do, to have people be in a circle and be heard by people. And at the end of a couple of hours saying, you know, I don't think I've ever been listened to this way before. And it's it's both sad and exciting that the simple act of, you know, hearing people feeling heard rather than being responded to with advice or questions or interrogation or whatever that is so common, you know, 
it's sad that it isn't more common that people are just received for what's being said to them. And so having a center that helps promote that understanding and that, and that skill, that practice would be a great thing. Yeah. So I'm just hearing that it's, that it's sad. I agree. Almost heartbreaking that this is a novelty for, for so many people to feel heard and seen. Um, and, um, and how, you know, and how important it is. Yeah. That's, that's the chime. <laughs> that's my time. Thank you. It's your turn, Jessica. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe I'll speak to Charles. Okay. Hi, Charles. Hello. Um, you know, a lot of the work that I do is around <clears throat> embodiment, embodied empathy, embodied deep listening. Um, so I would just add that as a core part of this is that it is so powerful to listen and it is so powerful to be able to be in our own body as we listen. Okay. So what I'm hearing from you is that you're involved in work and in, involving embodiment and listening and deep listening. And you find that to be a very powerful thing in your life. Yeah, and for others to be able to listen while they're in their body, because so many of us are not. Most of us live on the surface of ourself or outside of ourself, but not in our body. So the combination is so powerful. So I'm that's just present for me right now as we're as we're all together. So you're saying that it's important to be in your body. And rather than on the surface, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, but you find for yourself that's very important. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I'm just sort of sitting for a moment with with how to start. Um, I guess one of the first things that comes up is I'd love to see the facility, which I haven't ever. I've seen the gymnasium. Um, but I haven't seen how big it is, so I would like to see that. Um, you know, I have a lot of um, thoughts about uh, what is, what are the core things that I look for when I go to retreat and when I teach a retreat? There are a few <clears throat> important, really important non-negotiables for me. And I thought maybe it would be nice to share that with, with the group. Okay. Um, so you've seen the gym, but you haven't seen the main part of the, re of the center. So you're curious what it's like. And there are certain things that are important to you in retreats since you've attended so many and you'd like to share what those important things are. Yeah. So, um, you know, as a residential facility, I think, I, I guess the first question I have really is, who is the target audience? Who is the target demographic? I heard in the last Empathy Circle, Charles, that you had some vision about uh, you know, youth camps and things like that, um, in addition to, to many other things, but one of them being that. And just as an example, the 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 facility for residential for, for kids might be different than those for adults in terms of what is needed. Um, when I go on retreat, when I teach retreats, it's so important to me that the accommodations are clean and comfortable. And um, I've been at a retreat center from, you know, that has been, you know, filthy and disgusting, which I would never go back to. And then places that are like, I don't know if you've heard of 1440 up in Northern California. It's definitely something to look at, if not. And 
a place I teach at a lot in Costa Rica called Blue Spirit, where it's sort of the top end of, of the accommodations, which are never fancy, but there is a distinct quality of comfort, cleanliness, you know, and, and, uh, and quiet. That is essential for retreat. Okay. So it, one thing that's important for you is that the retreat center be clean. I mean, you don't want to go into a room that's all dirty and hasn't been taken care of. You feel that it should look nice and present nice and um, be attractive. And, and comfortable, yeah, and quiet and um, and beautiful even in its simplicity, that there's a feeling of beauty. Oh, that's my time, okay. To be continued. Okay. Thank you, I feel heard. Okay. Um, I'll talk to um, Greg Dawson since he hasn't been involved yet. All right. So people probably interested why I bought the property. Um, a friend of mine mentioned it was being sold at auction. And uh, well, the price, the initial bidding was pretty low, like 2.9 million. And I, I bid a few times and then stopped. And then it said next bid meets the reserve price. And so I thought, oh, I'll just bid one more time to meet the reserve price. And that happened to win the auction. So what I heard you say was that a friend of yours told you about the property that was coming up for auction. It was relatively low based on the value of the property at 2.9. You began bidding and then there came a notice, I guess, that said that uh, it had not met the reserve. So you bid one more time and ended up getting it at the reserve. Yes. So half of the one side of it has already been renovated, but it doesn't have furniture. Um, the other half, the dormitories still need re renovation. That would probably take a minimum of six, seven months before that's completed. So that's kind of the process where it is right now. So half of the facility has been renovated. The dormitories have not yet been renovated and that's gonna take six or seven months and some more resources to complete that. Right. Um, so I'm open to any use of a facility um, my idea was church camps, men's retreats, women's retreats, marriage retreats, youth camps. I know my brother has an interest in um, his empathy training. And um, I'm open to any other uses for the facility. Okay, you said that uh, your initial thought on the development of the property was for church camps, youth camps, men's and women's retreats, marriage retreats, but you are open to other options and specifically uh, Edwin's Empathy Circle um, organization. Yes, um, I guess that's all I have to say right now. So I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Okay, well, I'll pick Edwin since you're you're the last man standing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm listening. All right. Uh, I guess for me, being a local Santa Barbara person and having grown up here, the thing that I love about this community is we may have differing opinions, but this community is so generous. And part of what I got excited about when I joined the Turner Foundation is we do a lot of work for, for building and restoring community, but we also do a lot of work in bringing folks together that have diverse 
backgrounds or belief systems. So having lived a long time in Santa Barbara, you really appreciate that it's a very generous, caring uh, community. And what you really appreciate about the Turner Foundation is they do bring people together and sort of try to work to bridge those uh, different divides, social divides. And as we talked about, you know, before before the auction, as we talked about it, you know, we we have three communities in Santa Barbara now. Uh, they started off when Dean bought the first, um, I'll call it an apartment complex. We we refer to it as a community because it's become a community. The chief of police asked him if he'd lost his mind because it was one of the biggest call out points, one of the biggest arrest points for drugs and violence. And he didn't see how a foundation was going to make it in that place because of the turnover. So the Turner Foundation has three different properties, and one of them was an area that had a lot of crime, and even the police chief was wondering if the, if Dean was a bit crazy for, for taking that on. And I guess what, what got me so excited about what, what he's been doing, both with, with youth, with low-income folks, with... Uh, folks with special needs and families is we're about building community and we're community to have community you've got to have uh you have to have understanding you have to be seen heard and feel valued and so he moved his office into that apartment complex and was there for three years getting to know the folks putting the the money into the the facilities to create a place where people felt heard seen valued and they wanted to be mm -hmm. so the sort of a core value is uh is for people to feel seen heard and, and valued so dean actually moved his, the, the offices in, into the facilities there and and uh really made a place that people wanted to to be be there and really build that sense of community which is core yeah so with that in mind um part of my job is to share the vision with folks in our community and and to connect folks not necessarily go out and fundraise but to show people what's possible and then let their hearts lead them to be involved or not, but also to connect all of the other organizations in town that are doing things for our community that is making it better. I got to go, well, I'll stop there and mm. give you a chance to. Yeah, so one of the, your tasks is to bring the community together to uh, learn about the possibilities there. And it sounds like this is like a, a model of what can be done. And so, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, I went to a meeting about three, four weeks ago where there were different organizations that came together not to toot their horn, but to give stories of what was happening in our community because we get so much negative input, you know, on TV, social media, and that serves to divide. And what was great was to hear really what's going on in this community under the the radar so to speak of what's publicly consumed to know that there are great things going on here in this community that we need to celebrate and we need to support so you went to a, a an organizational meeting where people were just sort of ter telling their stories of, of what they're of what they're doing and it's really it's the underlying sort of space where people are just sharing the positive things that are happening in the community versus where you get in the media about all the division and, and strife. Well, the last thing I'll say, this is a world-class community. People come here from all over the world and having a place here to create community would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's in Santa Barbara is a world class uh, community and just uh, a place for to bring people together. You just feel would be really awesome. So you're really excited, maybe excited about that. See the potential. Definitely felt heard and understood. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Kent, can I speak to you?
Um, yeah, the, the what I'm advocating for working towards is this vision of a culture of empathy. I, it just really feels good just to hear everyone else have that a very similar vision, uh, you know, about Jessica and Greg and, and yourself about, you know, bringing people together. To, if they can really just listen to each other, I think we can bridge so many of the divides that are happening in our country, society and country in the world. So what I'm hearing from you, Edwin, is uh, is your well-focused passion about this vision of a, of a center of empathy. And it seems to, well, so that's what I've heard. Yeah, and the and that everyone else here is too. I, I'm hearing sort of echoes of that. That it, that sort of what are in the previous circle too. It was people just want to create something that has a positive contribution to the community. But with all the strife that Greg's talking about that you see in the media, that there's a I can feel a real sense of wanting to do something that's constructive and helpful and positive and yeah beneficial. So what I'm hearing is that you're. With all of this so far, you're encouraged. You feel like not only the six of us here, but in your larger circles, you're just hearing a lot of support in general for this idea of the hearing and sharing. You think that uh, you think there's a lot of common ground. And and this practice that we're doing, it may maybe seem sort of simplistic, but we use this. We have like, it, like Lou and I have this empathy tent with the other with a whole group. We go out to these conflicts where the political left and right are beating each other up here in downtown Berkeley. I mean, knock down, drag out, you know, bloody <laughs> kind of uh, fights. And we listen to both sides and then we try to bring the sides together to have dialogue. So and we use basically this empathy circle practice. And there's a documentary called Trump Phobia, what both sides fear that was this was sort of modeled uh, in, in that documentary. So you're aware that uh, at first hearing, people might think this is almost too simplistic. This is, you know, too elementary. So, but yet, it works uh, for you, and you uh, had some kind of a gathering of left and right, pro-Trump, I guess, and anti-Trump, and uh, and uh, you felt that it was really helpful. You were quite convinced that people hurt each other, and in fact, as I recall, I think you said that in another place they hugged each other at the end. They did, yeah. They they we had left and right giving each other hugs. So that was very fulfilling. It's in the documentary. I'll put the link in the in the description. So it's basically putting empathy as a our goal is really empathy, mutual listening. Uh, as a primary social and cultural value, and then actually creating a space for for that, and you know, having these practices. This is just one of the first step gateway practices for doing the, the you know that vision. So there's other ways of doing this, uh, and you're open to them. But mm -hmm. uh, but you have seen this work, and you're committed to it. Yeah, and. Uh, so the the center of what I'm envisioning is, you know, do we have the vision of a culture of empathy, bridging the social political divides, bringing people together, but then it can be an open, you know, a lot of different types of workshops, you know, just all kinds, whatever workshops fit under that umbrella. Uh, yeah. So you see as a central sun to this is your uh your empathy centers and the, the things can radiate out from it and there can be other avenues and sub chapters and sub activities but uh, uh i think i hear you saying the heart and soul of it at least in your mind right now is is this empathy center concept and uh we'd like to spread sort of this is emp empathy in the schools you know in politics Love to see, you know, for example, Joe Biden and Donald Trump do an empathy circle together, <laughs> have them actually listen to each other, have the, you know, in Congress, have the, you know, the left and the right, the Democrats and Republicans sit down in, in empathy circles. And the center can be a space to sort of advocate for that, uh, for that vision, you know, and bring people together and say, yeah, we need to have the politicians, you know, just start talking to each other, listening to each other. So I hear you say that you think you think this is a multidimensional. Th this can be applied all over the place. This could be applied, in your view, to schools, to educational centers, and even to the highest echelons of our government. 
Um, and of course, we all chuckle when you try to picture Trump and Biden, and yet you believe it. And yeah. I think you have, well, at yeah, the energy I, I've seen it yeah. happen. I've seen yeah. it, you know, people who are really hate each other just listen to each other and overcome divides. So I've just seen it happen. That was my yeah, final. Well, I just reflect that last part, then I feel heard. That uh, you've seen it. It's yeah. not just theory for you. And, you know, you read a book about empathy and you got excited and uh, and now it's your la latest cause. No, you've put 15 years into this and that's given you ample time to see if it works. And I you are very convinced heard. that it does. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so... Edwin, is it back? It's back to me now, correct? Back to you, select yeah, a right. listener from anyone. Maybe someone All hasn't right. spoken recently. And, uh, just because it seems like we have an order, I will again ask Lou to be the uh, uh, the listener here. Okay. Uh, and um, I feel very ready for, for this and um, uh, want very much to share some ideas, but I want to try to go slow. So... Uh, to review it first, I thought the place is the thing. I heard it sold. I want to know about the place. But what I believe strongly is that there's all kinds of places that don't have any vision. And the word of the day, in my mind, is what this meeting is all about, a, a vision. And uh, there's a saying, you know, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And uh, so St. Mary's, it's a nice place and cost millions. And, uh, but in the end, it don't, you know, there's other places like it in Santa Barbara. I could name four or five. I'm sure Lou could too, or not Lou, but Greg could. Um, but the vision is the thing. Uh, I'll pause for a second. Yeah. So you're really just saying that you think that having a vision is really crucial, that a physical facility is a physical facility and it doesn't have, there are lots of them and it doesn't have anything special. What would make something special is to have a vision that, that's inspiring or that calls people. Exactly. You exactly. So it, it, in my own, so I wanted to be a teacher, a young man, and I had a nice class and all that. And, and something was missing and I didn't know what, and people said, Oh, kids today, you know, they're this and that and the other, but that wasn't true. That wasn't true. They were great kids. They were every bit as good as all the people listening to this. Something was missing and I didn't know what. So I went on a search and I first came out to the Hopis of Arizona and that expanded to the Maori and that expanded to the Tibetans. And I was looking for things that worked and I put them into schools uh, in my lifetime outdoor sense of the sacred tribes vision quest rites of passage but what i found worked most of all and i'm in favor of everything i just named but what clearly over my lifetime somewhat like edwin's in a certain way what really worked was getting kids and teachers and parents together in this case around a fire just to listen. Everybody gets a turn. Um, and if you don't want to turn, you pass and you listen. And honestly, again, somewhat like Edwin, but coming at it from a different perspective, I have seen lives changed by young children, shall we say, adolescent in the most case, 12 to 15, but it works all over the place just feeling respected and listened. So um, so I'm excited about the process because I, I believe it works in education. Yeah, so can I reflect back what I heard so far? Please, please. Please? Yeah, so I'm really hearing you say that from your early days of uh, being a teacher and you spent well, a long career being a teacher, and from your early days of teaching kids, you realized that something was missing in the classroom, that you needed something more. And you went on a quest to kind of discover what that is. And you had lots of dis different experiences with different practices from different cultures. And you learned that bringing those different things in um, that that connected to something deeper, maybe something spiritual. You didn't say that, but it sounded like it. Um, that that 
that was the missing piece. And then you were saying that in all the experience that you had with that, what really mattered most was people listening to each other, sitting around and talking, taking turns, being heard, and that kind of being seen and respected, you think that's what makes the difference. And you, you're very excited about the idea of a center that would focus on that. And I must say, Lou, I'm, I'm new to this process and I really admire you. You have, uh, I mean, you've really got it. And in fact, what you intuited um, was a word that I, I guess we all use it carefully as spiritual because what that means to one person is not what it means to the next. But what was missing, I could see it, was a sense of the sacred, but not to make it Presbyterian or Catholic or Buddhist. Um, and and this process is actually, if I can say it, um, a sacred process. Yeah, so you're saying that uh, first you're appreciating me <laughs> for really hearing you and for kind of showing what it is to hear somebody and then also saying that um uh really sacredness i had i had said spiritual uh and you that has a different meaning for everybody but you said sacred is really the word that you were thinking of that and that and that doing this what we're doing right here listening to each other is kind of a sacred process and that that is kind of the essence of uh what is was the missing piece and and now what I want to do is segue into actually exploring the vision. But so actually, your time is up. Wonderful. I'll save it the next time. Thank okay. you. I de definitely feel heard. You're welcome. Thanks, Kent. Okay, so um, just uh, I would actually love to speak to Jessica again, but in the spirit of not having just a repeated okay. uh, mechanical pattern, I'm going to go to Greg instead. <laughs> All right. Um, is that all right with you, Greg? That's fine with me. Okay. All right. I'm in agreement with breaking the pattern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see. Well, so I'm, I'm so touched and moved by what Kent shared. Uh, re I resonate a lot <laughs> being an educator with what he's saying about education. And um, I did teach for about five years, a high school class in television news production that drew from kids from all over the LA uh, Unified School District. And it was so rich <laughs> to see all the different kids and where they came from, you know, it's very culturally and ethically mixed and um, and uh, just really evoked for me actually the memory of that and how um, teaching them news production by them being involved in actually producing a news program once a week, both in English and in Spanish, you know, them learning skills, them being heard, them being performing was a beautiful thing. It was great to, great to remember that. So you were very moved by what Lou had, to, I'm not Lou, <laughs> what Kent had to share. And it, it really harkened back to when you were teaching and having the opportunity to, um, create a culture and environment where kids were heard where they were valued but they could also take responsibility and they could be seen and uh, it was television production in the los angeles school district yeah thanks um and then that that thing of sacredness uh, which i think of as care and respect and dignity and just receiving the other person fully mm -hmm. and um yeah that i that also is very precious and i seek that and i th i think all human beings seek that i think that's part of our nature people don't know how to do it and they're afraid of it but i think we all want it uh yeah i'll stop there okay so you loved the the use of the word sacred and the whole idea of people uh, feeling cared for, respected, um, the, the idea of bringing dignity and honor to folks, because that's really what each of us as humans are, are seeking at the core level. 
Yeah. And I and I and one of the things that is exciting about the the residential aspect of the retreat center is that, you know, um people learning to listen to each other and to really be present with each other, uh, to receive each other, and actually to know oneself well enough that you know what you want to say, you know what you want to share about yourself. Um, that takes time. Um, it takes shifting patterns of thinking and shifting patterns of um expression uh it it's a it has to do with removing blocks you know or recognizing blocks and working through trauma um that's all stuff we do in the leadership training that i do and uh and it takes time to do that and so that's part of what excites me about res the res residential aspect of the center okay so you're very excited about the residential aspect because it takes time for for folks to change their thinking, their patterns, the way the way they view the world, um, and it takes time to. Um, now I'm getting stuck. Yeah, heal. Do the internal work. He, he yeah, healing the internal healing. Healing the trauma yeah. and conflict and things that they have experienced. Yeah. And I'm very I'm very curious to hear more from Jessica about the embodiment of listening, how you do that embodied. Uh so I agree the body is very important. And uh but I've never heard someone say embodied listening. So I'd I love to hear more about that. So you're fine. Finally, very intrigued with hearing more from Jessica about what does embodied listening mean. Yeah. And I, I feel fairly heard. Thanks, Greg. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. I'll break the pattern. I'll pick Jessica. Hi. Hi. Uh, let's see. I love what Kent said about the, the importance of vision. We've all heard the saying, without vision, the people perish. But I think that's true of any organization, without a vision, without a cause. And I would go further to say a cause actually is almost more important than a vision. Because people don't die for a vision, but they'll die for a cause. So you are really um, taken with what Kent said and agreed with it, the importance of vision. Um, and yet <clears throat> you think that uh, having a cause is almost more important than a vision because people will die for a cause, but not a vision. Yep, that was perfect. And I guess for me, the, the cause that gets me excited is seeing change and creating a culture where people are valued there's a book i read years ago called culture of honor and it really talks about you know if you boil it all down a lot of what we've been talking about is the culture of honor but the key to that is being unoffendable and that's really hard you know it's it's very easy to agree with folks that share your values it can be very hard to find that middle ground when your emotions get involved with folks that you disagree with. Yeah, so <clears throat> I might need reminding on the very first point, but you talked about the book, The Culture of Honor, and how important it is that people feel honored <clears throat> and how easy it is to honor people that you agree with and the key to it is being unoffendable or not reactive I would use a different maybe word to things that you don't agree with yep that was good I guess for me um when we were looking at this we were looking at we do a lot of work with youth we we have a lot of programs for youth. We do camps. We do a lot of educational 
stuff, one of my favorite things because I'm a musician is we actually have a music and imagination program for the students that live in our communities. And most of these kids would never have the opportunity to play a, an instrument. And there are folks in our community in Santa Barbara who will go buy the instruments for these kids whose family oh. can never afford it. And we have a director with a master's in music, but he's also got, he's, He's a community builder and he loves these kids really well. And he speaks life into them and identity into them as he's teaching them. They start off with jazz and then they can move on from there. Wow. So I'm hearing that you do a lot of work with youth and the importance of speaking truth into them and, um, the means that one of the ways that you have done that is through the vehicle of music and that you're a musician and that people in the community have gone out and bought instruments for the kids and that there's someone in particular who um, is using the the means of of music to to basically love on these kids and um what is more powerful i mean nothing right I mean, so that's one aspect, but we also are working with CEOs um, to create cultures of honor within organizations. And what does it look like to have a culture of honor within the organization where we can, we may differ in opinion, but still respect and honor one another and hear one another? Because often opposing opinions bring revelation. So you also work with CEOs of companies to promote a culture of honor. Um, And that when you can do that, sometimes the best ideas come out of an opposing viewpoint. Yep. I think that's all for me now. You're up. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Maybe I'll speak to Edwin listening. Hi. Hi. I too feel very touched by the incredible interest and support that you both, you and Charles are generating with this project and the way that you're going about it. I just really want to honor that. Um, The way that you're involving the community and all sorts of different viewpoints. So I just want to thank you and, and honor you for that. I'm hearing you really really appreciate and want to honor uh, Charles and I for doing these, this community empathy circles and how we're sort of approaching this uh, project. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm feeling a little torn between, you know, the big picture vision, which is the the goal and some of the other details and things that I'm, you know, might want to also get involved in. So I'm, I'm not really, um, sure which way to go, but I think I'll start with big picture. Um, It seems pretty clear that the the idea of having this be an, um, like the foundation being the empathy is the vision. Um, And then there can be all sorts of outgrowth from that and it can, you know, um, trickle down to, to really any any community or any organization or anything, it can be, you know, used anywhere. It makes me think about 1440 multi, um, multiversity it's called. It's a newer, it's a newer place in Northern California, Silicon Valley. They have like three main flagship programs. Um, and then everything is sort of, you know, an outgrowth of, of one of those main things. So it kind of makes me think, well, the empathy, piece would definitely be, if not the flagship, one of them. And then maybe identifying some of the other visions or causes that are, are closest, you know, to your hearts to, to have be the, uh, you know, the, the foundational pillars, if not, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So you're um, torn between two different approaches. One is the, the so the big picture vision uh, looking at that versus maybe the nuts and bolts uh, uh, of looking at that. So you're going to go with the vision. 
And for the vision, you're seeing that empathy, you know, is maybe one of the pillars for that. You're using 1440 as sort of a model that they have maybe three different pillars and that uh, you could see how empathy could be one of those pillars, maybe exploring other pillars. Uh, yeah, of that. exactly. So, um, and, and, and the interconnectivity of the pillars also feels important. And I liked what Greg said about the vision, uh, the cause um being almost more important than the vision and or the mission mm -hmm. um you know what order is most important to look at those things mm -hmm. so you're appreciating what greg said about a, a cause and and the relationship of a cause and vision and what's the order of of sort of organizing that or seeing it yeah, and I also really love the idea of using this for political um, communication. And I'm sorry, my husband couldn't join today because that that's a love of his as well. Um, so I can see the application, you know, everywhere, really. And I agree also with Lou about the importance of having time. And residential place, you know, when I do retreats, I like to do them for several days, if not a week, because it takes, first of all, a couple of days to just move out of our, you know, crazy mode of being and just settle. Um, not to mention working with, you know, our deep ingrained patterns and learning how to listen and all of those things. So I, I love the idea of having a place in Santa Barbara for multi-day deep work. So you really uh, agree with uh, Lou about for a real change to happen, having that residential multi-day work to really make those deeper changes that that really uh, sort of resonates with you. And yeah. also you could see the application, maybe the empathy dialogue for political and your husband is in, in, interested in that. And so a little bit of regret that he couldn't be here because that's really resonates with him. Yes. Um, you know, again, if what I, what I look for personally, I don't know if that's of interest to you or if it's more about just visioning for what it would be. Um, so I guess that maybe could be part of the open discussion later. Um, and that's my time. Yes, yeah, so you're not quite sure maybe what we're wanting with the visioning, uh, but there, there could be something, uh, some aspects uh, that we could talk about at other times too. I hope I got that. Thank you. I feel heard. Yeah. Okay. I'll speak to uh, Charles then. So, you know, the, the topic here is the vision or whatever is on your mind. So you can pretty much follow wherever the spirit leads you, so to speak. You know, if you're if something pops into your mind, it's it's not out of bounds, just whatever is really alive and you feel energized about. So the topic here is the vision or related things, whatever's on your mind. That things out of bounds. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was thinking of honor because I heard Greg that that was important to to Greg. And I was wondering, well, what is the relationship of empathy and honor? Uh, and uh, and that's kind of what the center would do is try to connect the empathy to any other sort of a value. How does empathy relate to honor? And so I'm just sort of sitting with that question. So you've when Greg mentioned honor, you're thinking about how honor relates to the um, <clears throat> to the retreat center or em to empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and for me, the maybe the honor and empathy is that when people are seen it's sort of an honoring of them so like everybody here has a chance to be to express themselves however they wish and they will be seen you might not agree with what they're saying but they will be seen in, in however they want to express themselves and be seen to their satisfaction i think that's a that's sort of honoring the humanity of 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 each person so you feel um, reflective listening honors the humanity in each person as they get to share and be heard. 
And the the uh, Greg was also mentioning about uh, conflict. What do you do with conflict? And the empathy circle, I would say, is sort of the foundation of conflict resolution. That just over and over again, we see it when we do. And I do conflict mediation. Is you bring parties together who are in conflict. And maybe they can't even listen to each other. And as a facilitator, you may listen to all the parties initially until they feel heard, which usually gets their tension level down. And then you get them to start listening to each other. And over time, you know, it can take time, but they start seeing each other's humanity. And then they it creates a space for resolving uh, that conflict. So you found that reflective listening is effective in bringing reconciliation between <clears throat> people who have conflicts because the facilitator can listen to both sides and that helps lower the um, emotions and then they can um, reflect with each other and that allows them to see the humanity in each other. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that they the, the emo, reduce the emotions. It's like everything is emotions, Jessica, with the embodiment, right? Even as we're even when we understand each other, that's a felt experience. So uh, it's it's all related to feelings and all in the body. So I don't want to. I wouldn't add that feelings or emotions are somehow negative because they're all welcome. Yeah. So feelings aren't um, negative; they're welcome. It's part of being in your body and experiencing it so they're not bad and if as jessica is a as a therapist as i understand it that the core of therapy is listening to people who are having personal issues that they're trying to work through so the empathy again is really central just for people's uh, personal growth and just working through internal issues that they're dealing with so if this empathy for me, I, I just see it as this core centralized central value that's been really unappreciated within the culture. And if we make it a central value within the culture, I think it could really transform culture. So that's kind of what I'm working at. So what do you, you want to see happen is building a culture of empathy, which helps connect people. It helps them um process their problems and deal with their issues and connects the society together yeah i feel fully heard thanks charles um okay i'll talk to jessica so i don't have anything specific to say but i'm curious about jessica's um work which is been doing what she likes about retreats, the kind of workshops she likes to experience or teach the subjects, subject matter. Um, so I'll just turn my time over to Jessica. So you're curious about what I do and what I teach on retreats and what sort of treats I like to attend and are you saying that you want to turn your time over to me to, to share those things? Yes. So you can talk about what you teach at retreats, what you like to experience at retreats, the subject matter. And... Okay. And um, I just, I just want to say uh, as facilitator that, so uh, Charles is ending his turn. Jessica doesn't get his time and her time. Okay. Uh, it's just, Charles is ending his turn, so. Okay, so then I would pick someone to share the, can I just share that to Charles then? And then he would get his time back or someone else? Well, since he was done speaking and didn't want to speak more, it probably makes sense to go to someone else, I'm guessing. Okay. Um, so then I'll speak to to Lou. Okay. Um, and respond to Charles. <laughs> um. So uh, for the last 20 years, I've been attending, I would say mostly, I there are exceptions, but mostly um, Buddhist meditation retreats. Um, and have done that really all over. And I would say the retreats that I, that I teach are more a combination 
of my work as a trauma therapist, a somatic trauma therapist expert for 30 years, and my work with, um, you know, mindfulness and deep listening and embodiment and meditation. So I combine the, the, the sort of spiritual um, embodiment meditation work with my work as a therapist in my retreats. Yeah, so you're saying that your your attendance of retreats has mostly been Buddhist retreats, and you've done them all over, and that the workshops that you teach, uh, you combine um, mindfulness and embodiment work and trauma work and other therapy, other maybe other modes of therapy. Um, you, your the retreats you teach are a combination of those things. Correct. I feel, yes. Um. And speaking back to the sacred, you know, I think when I personally am on retreat or teach retreat, I, I look for that feeling, the sacredness of the, of the place, of the facilitators, of the staff, of the food. You know what I mean? There's a quality uh, that permeates everything and it either has that magical quality or it doesn't. And that it factor is for me so critical when I bring people or when I attend because it is such a sacred time personally and for whatever group is there. A lot of people, well, I'll stop there. Yeah, so you're really saying that um, sacredness is very important to you and you think it's part of kind of the secret sauce of what makes transformation or deep work possible. And that when you go and that you think that it's uh, expressed in both the, the place and the food and the facilitators and the it just permeates um, a place and uh, uh, and you think it's really essential, you know, that uh, that that kind of care or attention uh, to the sacred is really important. I do. I do. Um... So I don't know if I have more time, but um, yeah. And and I also, I, I, I love watching, I think Greg spoke to this and Edwin and everyone, that the, the, the transformation and the change that can occur in a relatively short period of time, you know, the life changing, um, how it can change people's lives to to come together and do deep work in the right environment. Um, this last summer, I did a, a couple of retreats in Costa Rica, and, and I, I I I saw people who had never ever been inside their body before, and how it changed them. Because we live in our culture, we live in our culture from that from the neck up. Yeah, so you're resonating with what others have expressed about deep work or, or about being, be, people being able to shift uh, significantly and and um, uh, that you, that's your experience too, that you have seen that when people come together and the conditions are right and people feel seen and heard, that shifts can happen that seem miraculous uh, and that that you saw that recently down in uh, Costa Rica, where you saw people that you have used your observation, they'd never been in their body before, you know, were able to um, experience that and how transformational it was. And and you think we have a problem with our culture that we basically are living from the neck up and we're not really connected to our bodies. And you think that's really important. Yes, I feel heard. Thank you. And anything else you'd want to know, Charles, I'd be happy to answer another time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll go to Kent. Is that all right with you, Kent? Yes, I'm here. Right. It's interesting. I always want to hear from the person that it's okay that they be the listener because that like it's not a demand, it's a request, you know, that like, is it okay? Like we have to both want it so that that little just that those little pieces of interaction are part of showing respect and honoring each other i'll stop there 
Uh, so it sounds like Lou is open to a dialogue. He's uh, curious as to what I might be thinking. And uh, he is picking up on a word being used a lot here, the word honor and respect. And uh, he's reflecting that. Okay. Um, what do I want to say? You know what's in me right now is just a lot of feeling a lot of satisfaction in the in the conversation and and also the level of connection just feeling very connected and feeling appreciative of meeting uh kent and jessica and greg who i've not been with before and it's um i'm i'm just feeling a lot of joy uh and resonance and it, uh, what i hear is lou is speaking from his heart and he's feeling uh, quite positive about all of this. Uh, he feels this is a worthwhile experience and he's enjoyed uh, listening to six different people, several of whom he has never known before. And uh, he's suggesting that we're seeing this uh, circle in in action, you might say, with folks feeling connected. Yeah, and I'm... I'm um... I'm going to go check out 1440 because <laughs> I was really interested in what Jessica said about that. I had not heard of that. And it's up here where I am in Northern California. Uh, uh, and what and what Jessica was describing about them having like some flagship programs and other things that are underneath that um, to get kind of a better idea for myself if I think... Um, culture of empathy could be one of those or how, how those would fit you know again with the idea of um the center having a kind of a major theme that is its vision or its cause or whatever you want to call it um as opposed to just being a facility where a whole bunch of different kinds of things go on and and empathy work is one of those things um, to have a more kind of philosophically aligned or spiritually aligned um, uh, vision. So I, I'm I'm uh, anxious to check that out. Wow. Oh, um, and I may need your help uh, expressing this, but uh, one thing I heard is you, in looking at it, you see the empathy idea as the center of this uh and uh, in your words if i got it right uh, that does involve going back to something you said earlier uh, why whatever term a, a sense of the sacred a sense of honor a sense of a, of a of a spiritual energy that uh, jessica also spoke to did i what do you think have I caught it? Uh, well, actually, I mean, what you're saying is not wrong. It isn't quite what I said. I was really just saying I was interested in checking out 1440 and, and seeing uh, what they offer there and how it might influence my thinking about how um, the center of culture of empathy work could be a main pillar or the main pillar of a retreat center. Okay, so you're picking up on Jessica's uh, references, uh, I think twice now, to uh, 1440 in Northern California. You want to check it out, and you think you might learn something from checking it out that it applies here. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, and my instinct is, you know, after listening to the conversation, um, and I think this is a little bit of a repeat of what I was saying before, that building a culture of empathy and actually helping people become more empathic, you know, kind of opening their channels of empathy in their body, uh, you know, that's complex work and it takes time. And so the idea that there might be lots of different programs at a center that are done by lots of different practitioners that help do different pieces of that. That does seem, you know, that does seem very doable to me. Yeah, and so again, I think you're, uh, if I hear it correctly, focusing on the empathy center concept, but how there could be many uh, avenues, other projects, sub-projects, radiating out from that, connected to it, 
but you don't want to lose sight of the uh, of the central focus on empathy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's good. And my time's up, so it's your turn now. Well, thank you. And I, I'd like to go fast. I'd like to focus on the word vision. So, who I, who do you want to be your reflection? Oh, sorry. Uh, now, I think I would go to Edwin because mm -hmm. I'm not, everybody gets a turn here. And I'm mm -hmm. anyhow, Edwin, I'm really taken with the word vision. Uh, I think it is a central thing here. Uh, this is a brainstorming session, but what you invited us to was something called uh, a vision for the, the place. I'd like to lay out one. I'd like to make it clear that I'm only brainstorming here, that I'm well aware that people throw out a bunch of ideas. They're good ideas or not, but it gets people going. It gets people wrestling with it. And what you end up with is not what you started with, but at least you had an initial outline. I'd like to propose one. Mm -hmm. So you're getting onto the topic of the vision. It's, this is a brainstorming session, and you'd like to lay out a, an outline for that. It's just a start, and things go in different directions. Thank you. And again, if, if I had to stress one word, it'd be vision. But the vision, it's not like the place is most important, but the place to to reflect the vision, it must have other things partly for financial reasons and uh, and other reasons so um uh, so here got, come some ideas that mm -hmm. uh, i think charles has a gold mine uh santa barbara is a year-round place that's unusual in this country uh you can have happy things at your center year-round uh the transportation situation in santa barbara is ideal for what you're thinking about you have plane train bus car freeway even boats to get there uh, you have an advantage, uh, possibly in cost, because Santa Barbara is in a very expensive place. Uh, but you have the ability to house um, folks inexpensively. That's unusual in the town. Can I reflect that back so far? Please. So you're Please. you're going into the benefits of the space. It's it's a gold mine. It has Santa Barbara has all these uh, advantages. You know, great. Uh, year-round uh, climate people can you can do events there has great uh, transportation people can come you know a lot of good transportation yeah and another huge problem I have a friend who runs a school in Santa Barbara he feels he cannot keep the school in 15 years because the teachers are basically middle-class people who cannot afford mm -hmm. to live in Santa Barbara it's too expensive but once again you have an advantage that you can house staff and feed them mm. a huge plus for your thing so also, another huge plus which i forgot to mention before was just that it's really expensive to live in santa barbara a friend of yours he's going to lose his staff because they can't afford to live there but with being able to house people and staff there it's just a, a, a huge uh, benefit and as others have mentioned who live in Santa Barbara, it is remarkable with the talent it has. Uh, one of the speakers today said world class. I would totally agree with that, uh, that you have a, just it's an unbelievable situation. So now in my mind, uh, I picture a bright sun called the Empathy Center, and I picture it as a circle and it's got rays going out of it. The central part, I stress, is your empathy idea. But here come a bunch of subsets to that uh, i'll start with the easy ones you have a uh, basketball you have volleyball you have yoga you have gardening you have surfing you have kayaking all these things are easily available as subsets which would help support your program you also have santa barbara itself its history touring around the as jessica and others have mentioned and in your first uh, Thing you had an artist that is the town's crawling with artists and craftspeople, pottery. And so all of these things I've named are there. They're pretty easy to take it up a notch. Educators, you have something that is needed in the world of education. That is where I come from. And you're on to it. You're on to it. And uh, educators want to come to Santa Barbara for many reasons. It's a nice place to come to, but they could enjoy everything I just named from basketball to kayaking, but mostly empathy center. And okay, can uh, I reflect that back? So the, you're, you're kind of creating this vision that with empathy as sort of being the central sun that kind of radiates out. 
and within what those radiates into all kinds of different activities, everything from kayaking to hiking, just to all these surfing, all these different activities. And yeah, that's, and I think it was more to it, but I think, yeah, that's why I, I remember. think you're doing wonderful. So okay. uh, for example, the school that I started, the Santa Barbara middle school is going like gangbusters. It's just overwhelming. People want to come to study it, but they have no place to stay. You could house educators mm. who learn uh, from, from visiting other schools. I've named one in particular. Also, um, as I mentioned to you, Edwin, and won't go into it in detail, there's so many native legends about Santa Barbara. The Tibetans have them, the Chumash have them, uh, the Lakota Sioux have them. Uh, and you could be bringing in native cultures, Tibetan, Maori, uh, I'm getting the time sign, um, but you could bring yeah, let me let me reflect that back. So it's really that there's a real talent pool in, in Santa Barbara with artists and, and educators and also that educators, you know, it's where do you stay? There could be a space for them to stay. And also the bringing in uh, sort of the you, you mentioned the Maori or just different uh, indigenous peoples. There's they have an interest in that space and they could be uh, brought in as well and. So that was the time. So it'll come around again. So you feel heard? I do very okay, much. Thanks. Uh, Greg, can I speak to you? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that's wow. That's that's a lot to think about. The the uh, That's a bit how I see it, too. That I see empathy as sort of a sun is a. Is a uh, is, uh, is sort of a central value value. And it, and it ties into other values like uh, uh, you know, listening, I think empathy is just deep listening, right? And so it's really just seeing deep listening as a central value. Okay. Uh, you were musing about how much uh, Kent shared and that that's a lot to think about, but you, you really um, agree with the idea of empathy being the center of the sun with lots of rays to use Kent's language coming off of that, but that's the that's the defining value of uh, the center. Yeah, and, and and empathy just being a form of deep listening. It's it's bringing in, empathy sort of brings in that embodiment that Jessica is talking about. It's you know it's about sensing into the felt experience, the fullness of, of someone else. So it's just a, it's a deeper form of listening. Deep listening is, uh, well, to, to quote what you last said, it was it's a deeper form of listening, but it's being able to, um, I'm trying to think of the word for this, just being present so that you're not hearing just the words, but you're hearing the heart and the intention. Yeah, of that's a good word for it is the presence and also a sense of openness and free speech. Like I'm very much for free speech is like you can say anything express anything there's no boundaries in terms of what you can bring up so i see free speech is 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 really core uh and free empathy so it's we're balancing free speech with free empathy uh basically is uh yeah so you value different opinions and they have equal value and you want to create a space where we have the freedom to speak and to also use the empathy uh, model to make connection and for people to be heard, not necessarily agree, but to be heard and to value one another. And then also, once people start feeling heard, there's a sense of care. You start caring. Like, I care about all your well being. You know, the more I hear about you, the more I get to know. I have a real sense of care uh, for each and every one of you. So uh, that's another. Uh, value. I think it just grows out of people willing to listen to each other. Yeah. So listening to one another helps us to care for one another. And that's kind of an outgrowth of, of the empathy model. Yeah, I, I just, I'm still sitting with Kent's uh, sort of vision and just all the things he mentioned, he just has, I just, I just get really excited hearing him talk about sort of that vision, how he, he's really tuned into all the different aspects of of Santa Barbara and just can see, you know, how uh, a center can sort of, you know, can sort of shine, I guess, basically shine in, in Santa Barbara. So I really appreciate that, all those insights. 
So you're still taken by Kent's vision of a center that can really shine in Santa Barbara and highlight what Santa Barbara has to offer, that it'd be a place that will draw people to the center naturally. And then the resources that folks get here would, and I'm going to extrapolate a little bit, would then be able to be taken back into their communities. So this could be a model for change and transformation. Yeah, that's close. I, I feel fully heard. Uh -huh. okay. All right, so I guess I'm up. I'm going to do Lou. Okay. All right. Um, kind of a couple of things that, uh, you know, I could prattle off a zillion ideas for what the center could be, but I think it's, for me personally, it's probably more important to figure out, okay, what's the, what's, what's the core? What, what are the foundational values? and beliefs that we have that are going to drive or be the filter that we evaluate everything through. So if we have core pillars for a center, then when opportunities come, they have to go through the filters. They have to go through our, our values. Yeah. So you're saying you have lots of ideas that you could, that you could express about for the center, but you think the most important thing of like what might happen there, who might be involved, but you think the most important thing is to establish this as a set of values that are foundational to the vision so that those filter, those values can be used as a filter in evaluating, you know, what kinds of things should be done there. Yep. Um, I want to give an example of uh, something that happened at one of our communities to give you an idea of what transformation can look like. And this is talking about a student, but this could be just very, 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 very much the same. A CEO could be a teacher, could be a doctor, could be a business owner, could be anybody when they grab hold of this idea. Yeah, so you want to share an example with us of transformation that you've experienced in the programs that you do. Uh, and it's, a, it's an example about a student, but it could be a person from any walk of life. Right. So there's this little guy named Robbie, who's, he's, as, as my uh, grandmother would call him, he's a wee fellow. He's very slight, he's small, he's kind of uh, shy, and he was being bullied at the school. He would then come every day to one of our after school programs where Madison, his teacher, spent a great deal of time of I would I would use the terminology calling out the gold in him, really recognizing who he is, what he carries, what he brings to to all the rest of the students and, and valuing and honoring him to the point that after three or four weeks of this bullying, he turned to his bully and he said, you know, that's not what Miss Madison says about me. And then he repeats to this bully who she sees him as. And he said, I don't have to receive this. Yeah, so you're sharing a story about a young kid who is bullied at school, who is kind of shy and, yeah, and, um, and that because of the kind of um, being seen, uh, positive validation and um, by his teacher, uh, really came to understand himself more or see himself more clearly. Mm -hmm. And after about four weeks of that, uh, he was actually to, able to bring that to the bully in, in response to what the bully was doing to say, you know, like, I know who I am and uh, I don't have to listen to what you are saying about me. And I guess the other thing that that all talks about identity. And I think identity is huge in when we're talking about interpersonal communication, because I think a lot of a lot of the time we wear masks or we play different roles. And I think any type of I've been to a lot of business conferences because that's my background. And most of them are talking about best practices and um, 
systems and ways of maximizing growth of the business, but they don't talk about leadership. They don't talk about creating a culture where people are not only seen, heard, and valued, but they're empowered. Where the leader is the one who's doing all of those things and coming under their folks. And then there are also, it, the, the, the stuff that I've been taught has been predominantly, you know, competitive. And I, I'm a big competitor. I play golf, college sports. But there, you know, if you're on a team, you're only as strong as the weakest link. Yeah, so you're, you're saying that you come from a business background and you have a lot of experience with business, working with businesses and going to business conferences. And what you see is that most of the things that leaders in business are taught or business people in general are taught is about systems and uh, processes and practices, things that are external. And they're really designed to help them be more competitive, more successfully competitive. And that you think what's really needed is more leadership training where leaders learn how to see people, honor people, recognize people, and help teams do that with each other. And you think that would lead to much more success. Yeah. And now I'm going to give a buddy of mine a plug. Great book. If you guys want to read it. Is it my time? Yeah, it is. But go ahead. You can say the one more thing. It's called Fulfilled Building a Passion and Provision uh, Company by Michael and Catherine Redmond up in Chico. Great book. Okay. So in this in this last piece, you recommended a book uh, uh, to the group that you think is a fantastic book you know, that deals with the things you've been talking about. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Jessica. Okay, great. So I don't know that I have a lot more that I want to say. I'm going to think about it for a minute. You know, I agree with what Greg was saying about leadership. <laughs> um, uh, and that's certainly aligned with the leadership training that I do, um, you know, that knowing yourself uh, helps you understand others more uh, and helps create an environment where people feel seen and heard and accepted and can deal with differences uh, effectively. I'll stop there. So you're just sensing into what feels alive for you. And when you did that, you were reflecting on what Greg just said about leadership and that it resonated with your experience and how important um, knowing oneself is and how that reverberates into understanding others and, you know, everything that we've been talking about um, being more did you use um you didn't use the word empathetic but of course empathetic or compassionate or what were the words you use sorry i don't remember <laughs> yeah just just that knowing oneself is 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 essential in in understanding others yeah And the other thing I'm so the other thing I'm feeling right now is uh, some sadness about how rare that is. Um, uh, and gratitude for my uh, the, the I guess the teachers that I've had and the family I grew up in. I I not that it was perfect, but I I have a relatively healthy nervous system. <laughs> Um, cause I'm aware that a lot of people don't, they grow up in very, very difficult circumstances and they have damaged nervous systems and it's really hard for them to 
they've developed lots of protective mechanisms and behaviors and to survive uh and that it's difficult to um heal 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 from those things so first you express some sadness about how rare it is that people are um connected to themselves and therefore for others to others and then you express some gratitude um, to your teachers and to your family and your circumstances that have allowed you to have a very healthy nervous system relative to most people. And um, uh, yeah, and that without that, you know, and that trauma disrupts our nervous system to such a degree that it makes all of this much harder. Um, yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. And so I'm just feeling a lot of appreciation for for Greg and the work that he's doing and for Jessica, people that work in trauma and to heal people and and Kent, who's an educator. Yeah, just feel appreciation for all of you and the work that you do. We need everybody. <laughs> we need everybody who's doing work um, to try to heal the world. Yeah, so just expressing gratitude to to us and to everyone who's helping to heal the world. And I would add you in that as well. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I feel hurt. Thank you. I don't need to say more. Okay. okay. I thought we have about uh, 15 minutes, 16 minutes that uh, I thought we'd just open it to open discussion without any reflection and maybe consider, you know, how might you like to be involved in the retreat center or what would you like to offer or request just to sort of, um, and Jessica, I know is a, having done retreats, so so many, you know, would love to have you hold some there. And uh, so, so anything anyone would like to say, we can just kind of open it up. If you want to start just Jessica, since it was your turn too. I, um, I'm just feeling very um, excited and um, interested and, um, you know, would love to be involved in some way. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I mean, certainly hosting a retreat, but also just in the um, building of something as well, you know, and, and, just loving all the people that I've met today. And um, so, you know, would love to continue that conversation in whatever way would be most useful for you all. Well, the conversation is continuing every Monday. We're holding these intro cafe or these ca empathy cafes. You're welcome to come to multiple ones. Uh, Kent, I felt that there was a lot more you had to say. You know, you can come to uh, some more cafes and, and share some more of those ideas. And we can also, you know, meet uh, outside of, of this. So that's those are some possibilities. I, I did have one question. Mm -hmm. Would I be able to see the facility? Oh, yeah, I did want to mention you can go up there. It, it, the gate is open. Uh, we can just... Uh, uh, if uh, Christian is the person who's uh, sort of... Uh, groundskeeper and his father uh, jose so we can just let you you know let just let us know when you want to go there we just gave you his phone number and you can call just to be sure he can open everything okay for perfect you. i'd love to just so, walk around and see what it what it feels like yeah that'd be great and yeah. invite any friends you know it's like yes. like greg you know all, all that community or, or can't anyone you know just have them you know come take part in one of these uh, circles and you were about to say something greg Oh, I was going to say, I, I would love to go up and um, walk through the facility and, you know, bring, bring our team up there, you know, because we were, we were thinking, of, you know, what a great place with the dormitories to do stuff, not only with our students, but what about bringing single, single family, you know, single parent folks up there to help, you know, give them some tools and give them some respite, maybe, you know, do some conferences that relate not only to our our communities, but also uh, down the road for leadership. Um, we're working on something that I'm pretty excited about, but I'll save the details of it, but it's basically um, a leadership management 
practice or style that um, we're real excited about. Mm -hmm. I'll probably okay. have conversations with you, Lou, Lou later. <laughs> I'll, I'll put my email in the in the chat. Great. You want to contact me? You were all on the email thread, so you have right. uh, each other's oh, okay, email. Good point. So you can contact each other. And I'll also, yeah, I'll I'll uh, send uh, you all uh, Christian's uh, contact info, and maybe you can even take a trip up there, you know, meet in person too. I would love to meet you, Greg, if you're going up. Okay. Good. Edwin, giving you some feedback here. I, I, I love the process. I'm new to some of this. Uh, getting ready for this meeting, I have four pages of notes here, and I'm amazed that except for four things, I had the opportunity to share everything in the time allotted. And so I'm just in all of this. I'm also in all of the way folks listen, because I realize sometimes I'm not listening because I'm getting ready for my turn. <laughs> and... and uh, I just admire that. I feel like a student and I like to feel like a student. You said, how can folks be involved? And of course, as you know, I'm full of ideas and happy to share them. As my friend Roger always says, uh, my ideas are free and probably worth what you paid for them. Uh, I do have many contacts in Santa Barbara after my 35 years there, you know about that. If you form a nonprofit, which I think you probably will, or at least a side of it, I can help you with that if you like. If you form a board in Santa Barbara or elsewhere, I can help you with that if you like. I've been on many. My particular interest is education, as you know, and uh, would be happy to help you there. Also, if you need any form of organizational help. The last thing I might mention in fun is if you see uh, Greg's picture there. Behind Greg, you see what the local Chumash people call the eagle. Very few white people know about that, but that is the Isle of Mu. It's not called that by the non, by the whites. It's called by another name, but that's an eagle flying in from the east, and it's bringing the old world to the new world, and that is what that large thing in the distance behind Greg is. Oh, Thanks. if I if I may, another organization in Santa Barbara just forming is called the Das Pueblos Institute. My business partner, Roger Himovitz, uh, has uh, established it. And uh, like the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, they wish to bring people to Santa Barbara, but they do not have housing. Once again, I would just mention that Edwin and Charles have housing for related organizations. Yeah, so that housing seems to be a big uh, issue. And uh, there is a dormitory that has uh, uh, two floors, 20 uh, spaces. And Charles had wanted to create uh, actual rooms with bathrooms. I think that's one of the next projects. So there'd be 20 rooms there with uh, uh, you know, separate rooms could be doubles. And then there's another part of it, which you can all see if you go up there, uh, that needs renovation too. There's uh, another sort of a dormitory area with I think another 20 or 30, you know, smaller spaces and maybe have shared bathrooms. And so yeah, the housing was, seems like a big issue there. May I ask Charles, uh, did, Charles, do you think the facility comfortably holds 80 people? You muted, muted it, Charles. Um, I think it could hold 80. Sure, and Quant has been renovated and everything. Thank you. I think it had at least 80 um, seminary students at one time. I think right so. Now, right now, the dormitories, were, they were set up so that there's like um, one or two people per little room they were just separated by curtains and then they had um, shared bathrooms so in that dormitory we're looking at making a little bit larger rooms with um, private bathrooms in each room um, can, 
the the um, architect just told me um um she's from 196 architects there in Santa Barbara she worked on the previous renovation on the other side and she said this Friday she's going up there with some of her colleagues to look at the space the dormitory building and the library building um so they can go over and then they'll give me a proposal and some possible layouts and I can share those possible layouts with cool. any any of you who wants to see them and get your feedback. Thank you. So I wanted to ask Kent is do you is 80 a significant number? Do you think that that's a good the right number or uh, is there some reason 80 is an important number? And not that it's important Lou, but uh I mentioned how I was involved with that property with the uh, Santa Barbara Summit for Tibet. And just like Charles and Edwin, there's a vision, but you got to make it kind of financially understandable. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of start with, well, how many, what's the right number for this place? And then you can play with that and, you know, make a budget. And right. but if, if the right number is 40, that's a lot different than 80 or 100. I, I agree with Charles that in my research, uh, I was led to believe that historically there were about 80 monks or, or whatever the proper word would be. But I have seen the facilities and he's quite right that most people today would not want one of those rooms with a curtain. Mm. But Jessica, you had something? I saw your hand went up there for a second. Oh. I don't remember. I mean, I have lots of questions and lots more things to share. So maybe I'll pop into another one of these. I, I guess one thing I did wonder is, um, I know last time you said you were going to be keeping the the chapel, correct? The, is yeah. there a structure? Good. And is there a parking lot in the center of the buildings? Is that what I saw in one of the pictures? And is that, is that going to be, I mean, is that going to remain or are you going to maybe consider beautifying that courtyard, that center area a bit and let the parking be by the uh, gymnasium? I don't know that there would be enough parking if it was all by the gymnasium. There's 26 or 27 parking spots in the middle there. Um, I think we would need those spots, but I'm open to any ideas of beautifying it and making I want to see it because I really feel like that is such an important area in the center that's being used for parking and cars and when you're on retreat you don't want to see parking and cars it's it's like you really want that to be elsewhere um so I want to go up there and see it but I mean that area could be so amazing if it wasn't a parking lot mm. and I, I do think it's important but of course you need parking um but Anyways, I'd like to look at it. And the chapel too, I mean, I would like to look at that as well because I can imagine not only for that purpose, but, you know, yoga and meditation and, you know, all of that stuff in, in that space as well. Um, if you'd be open to that, that's not sank, sank religion, I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I, I just thought I'd read unless a couple examples of the flagship programs at 1440 are... Healing Our Healthcare Heroes, uh, True North Leadership, which seems in alignment with some of the things that have been said today, and Healing Our Education Communities. Um, they are closed mostly right now for a multi-year study dedicated to corporate social responsibility, employee wellness, and human flourishing. So I don't know how many programs they're actually offering right now, but they've only been open for about five years. And I was there the very first week they opened and where they've come in five years is astounding. And I believe that you can create something like that here in a very short period of time. They do have, you know, a spa and well health and wellness and hiking trails and, you know, a pool and incredible farm to table food. And I don't know if any of that's in your thinking. But I do think in today's age, that is somewhat required for the level of what, you know, you want to create. 
people come from all over the world and they want to be comfortable. They want to be well fed. You know, they want to be respected from the moment that they set foot on the property by everyone. Like you said, you know, this whole theme of honor, respect. Um, and I think you really could build something amazing there. Um, their mission, I wrote it down, a beautiful and nurturing destination where people and organizations can gather in community to explore, learn, reflect, connect, and regenerate, re-energize. Just, you know, something simple like that. Another place, the one in Costa Rica, an extraordinary setting for those dedicated to spiritual transformation, personal development, and environmental sustainability. So whatever your thing is, you know, um, the cause, the mission, the vision, I, I, I just think there's, you know, Esalon, I know you lived there, Edwin, for a year. I'd be so curious what your experience was like, is like. But from what I hear, the biggest complaint is that the accommodations are so old and maybe not up to, they don't need to be fancy, but, you know, they're just not even up to the level that a lot of people that go on retreat want. Um, so I, okay. yeah, it was great. Just, yeah. It's comments. Uh, so do come to other circles. We can also scale these up right now. We're doing them every Monday. We, if there's interest, we can add more to continue this uh, dialogue. Do check it out, you know, to, and then, you know, bring any sort of feedback. And uh, I do want to keep us on track. So maybe just uh, 30 seconds, just how was the circle process for you? And uh, yeah, Greg, do you want to just quickly, so Actually, closing? I really it. You know, I was, I didn't know what to expect. I've done stuff similar to this. We did it in a, uh, in a group up in Reading where there were some racial tensions and this model type thing worked awesome and so i think this is a good way to have folks connect hmm, great well thanks for having joined us uh kent do you have any sort of final yeah i took comments? a lot of notes and the one thing i would cite is what greg said quote a deeper form of listening and i think as i leave that'll be on my mind and lou uh yeah wonderful conversation and just really happy to meet greg jessica and, and ken uh charles um i just appreciate all of you your passion for this project your input um yes jessica and greg um will share the caretaker's phone number you can go up there take a look and we want to hear your feedback thank you all for participating and Jessica? Yes, I would just echo everything. It's been lovely to meet all of you. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Edwin, for facilitating and, and Lou and Charles. And I want to thank everyone for taking part. And just feel free to, you know, reach out and, you know, continue the discussion, join future uh, empathy circles. If you have a group of friends that would like to take part, we can create, you know, separate events for those. And so we just want to bring people together, start thinking about and actually start uh, doing uh, work on the property. We're starting to clean it up and you know, uh, we'll be doing different, as Charles said, different renovations and really want the community uh, input and and involvement uh, for that matter. You know, hardcore step-by-step, -step, you know, programs and ideas to be implemented there. So we're really open to that. So just to keep us on time, uh, I want to thank you all and uh, Look forward to seeing you and I'll send out that email right away with the uh, contact info for Christian. So bye for now. We usually Thank do our you. jazz hands. Uh, goodbye for, <laughs> goodbye. All right, Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.